Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson, and I'm a physician assistant. I'm also a member of the Medicating Normal team, where I work doing outreach for the film. And I'm a member of the prescribed harm community, which means I was also a patient who took and withdrew from prescribed psychiatric medication. Um, our guests today are three other medical professionals. We have Dr. Christy Huff, Dr. Mark Horowitz, and Dr. Peter Gordon. Um, all four of us share something in common. Aside from being trained as medical professionals, we all took prescribed psychiatric medication that caused harm. And we've all spoken out publicly about our experiences. So thank you so much um, for joining us today, our guests and everyone in the audience. And I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, first, I think we can all just briefly introduce ourselves, um, a short version of our story, and sort of how we came to take psychiatric medication and then um, be harmed by it. So who wants to go first? I can go first. Okay. I'm Christy Huff and I was prescribed Xanax back in 2015 and I was taking it, uh, what I thought very briefly for insomnia. I was having a crisis with dry eyes and I couldn't sleep, it was so painful. And within three weeks I started developing dependence and tolerance and but we didn't really know what was going on i was misdiagnosed and um, eventually figured out uh, with my own research on the internet that i was uh, experiencing xanax dependence and interdose withdrawal and i ended up switching over to valium and it took me over three years to taper off that was pretty ill the entire time um, and about two years off right now and doing much better, but still have symptoms related to uh, my benzodiazepine injury. And I'm currently director of Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, where we educate about the adverse effects of prescribed benzos. And just quickly, um, Christy, what is your medical history or your training? Oh, yes, I should have mentioned that. I'm a cardiologist. I'm not currently in practice, but um, I've been out of practice since 2011, I believe, um, after my child was born. Um, but yeah, I was trained in internal medicine residency and then cardiology after that. Mark, you wanna go? Well, uh, hi, uh, my name's Mark Horowitz. Um, I'm a psychiatry trainee. Um, I also did a PhD um, in the neuroscience of psychiatry and how antidepressants affect the brain and the biology of depression. And I'm currently a clinical research fellow in psychiatry. Um, I also took the drugs uh, that I prescribe and that I studied. Um, I first took an antidepressant when I was 21. Um, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a neurotic Woody Allen character type of person. Um, and I I wasn't very happy back then at all. Uh, I did a lot, I think, in retrospect to um, my course at university and uh, anyway, a lot of different existential identity issues I see in retrospect. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what happened over the next few years, um, but I, I was diagnosed with further conditions after starting an antidepressant. The diagnosis that I was given was narcolepsy because I was very tired all the time. And that led to further prescriptions of psychiatric drugs, stimulants, which caused anxiety, which led to more antidepressants to the point where over the, over the 10 or 15 years after that, I ended up on, at different points, four or five psychiatric drugs. We went through about 40 altogether. Um, during that period of time, um, my ability to function um, got worse and worse to the point where I had trouble keeping up with work, went to part-time work, and I thought about quitting to go on disability. Um, it also had a very big effect on um, my relationships, my social life, uh, and I was always told that it was narcolepsy, that I had a, a bad sleeping disorder. Um, and, I, and I sought out the health specialists again and again. Um, uh, 
sort of at, a bit at rock bottom a couple of years ago, I, I decided to try to come off all of this medication. And I kind of discovered a couple of things um, in that process. One, it was an incredibly hard process to do. There were awful side effects. I tried before in the past um, much too quickly and I ended up having all sorts of symptoms, panic, trouble sleeping, um, really to the point of being suicidal, which, which was not my kind of baseline neurotic self, something quite different. So I sort of discovered it was very hard to come off these drugs. I discovered that the guidance that was given by the professors and experts that I had studied with was uh, very unhelpful. Um, and I realized that people on uh, online peer support communities, especially surviving antidepressants, had much better knowledge and much better advice to give than the specialists and academics that I studied with. So I'm actually still coming off for psychiatric drugs. I'm still on four of them, but at much lower doses, two and a half years into the process. And I've spent the last couple of years trying to communicate what I found on online forums to my colleagues through academic articles, um, where I, I really see myself as a, as a translator. I'm just putting neuros and scientific terms to what um, a lot of very brave and clever people have worked out off their own bats in their own kitchens most of the time. That's me. Thanks, Mark. Um, Dr. Gordon? Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, please just call me Peter. Um, I retired from medicine a year ago. Um, I was an NHS, I've been an NHS doctor in Scotland for 25 years. All that time I worked as a psychiatrist. Um, my wife is a GP. I have two grown up children. Uh, I was started on a medication called um, Proxetine. It's uh, other new, uh, it's other, it's maybe known as Siroxet or Paxil. Um, I was started on this in 1997, uh, late 97, um, for anxiety. Um, this was during the Defeat Depression campaign. I, at the time, I was struggling. I admit that. Um, uh, we had a, we had our first child was born. Uh, my sleep was poor. I've always been probably constitutionally a little anxious. Never had depressive disorder at all in my time. Um, anyway, with within a few months of taking that, um, I, I I I acknowledge that the drug probably helped me a little bit. Hard to see how much, uh, but sh with within a few months of, of taking it, I tried to stop it, um, or I just naturally stopped it. Um, and within uh, 24 hours, I felt terrible, um, physically, mentally, and um, with um, uh, in all sorts of ways. And but to cut a long story short, this is a drug that has caused me absolute hell. It's a drug that I, I remain on today. Um, and um, it's a drug that almost cost me my life. And it's a drug that I still live with. I'm phys physiologically dependent upon it. It's hard to define that. It's a drug that I, excuse my language, I fucking hate. Absolutely hate this drug. Um, um, it's catching up with me. I'm 53 years old. Um, and... Um, uh, I have I I have extensively um, done my best. To sh it's not because I believe that my experience translates to all people. I think that psychiatric drugs. I I I'm not anti-medication. My concern is that most psychiatric drugs are prescribed on the basis of very short-term studies, and the studies um, do not cannot say anything about long-term treatment. And unless the, unless the medical profession and the scientific communi community listen to people who are living with these drugs in the long term, and if they ignore what we are saying, and the, the, those experiences should include those people who have positive experiences of long term medication, but we, they need to listen to the fact that these medications do not, any intervention 
can have the potential for harms and benefits. But long term, but long term use um, is in terms of psychiatric um, treatment generally lacks an evidence base. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So um, briefly, my name is Nicole Amerson and I trained as a physician assistant and um, around 2005, I was prescribed Xanax. I had some just in hindsight, very mild stress at work and um, a general practitioner um, prescribed Xanax with no warnings whatsoever about um, you know, any of the risks of taking it. Um, hindsight is 2020, and I didn't realize at the time, but when I was taking it, I started having adverse effects from it, probably quickly developed tolerance and interdose withdrawal, um, which was misdiagnosed as more um, you know, psychiatric distress, and I then entered the psychiatric system. And over the course of five years, I was prescribed um, six psychiatric medications in total. Two were benzodiazepines and a Z drug. Um, and then I was put on Adderall, Remeron, and Seroquel as well, which were just sort of prescribed to combat the adverse effects of the drug prior. You know, Adderall didn't let me sleep. And so Remeron was given for sleep and Seroquel was given for sleep. Or if Adderall, you know, made me not hungry, then Remeron was supposed to increase my appetite. Anyways, over the course of that five years, I became incredibly ill. Uh, like Mark, I stopped functioning. Um, I couldn't work anymore. I couldn't read a book. Um, I started developing all sorts of physical um, ailments like rashes all over my body, severe weight loss. Um, I discovered a story from a, uh, another person like us who all took psychiatric medications and who told his story on the internet. He just happened to have a uh, really great skill of writing. And so he was in a big magazine over here in the United States that my dad happened to have a subscription to. And when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what's happened to me. Um, within like seven days of reading the article, I had checked myself into a detox center, which again, hindsight is 2020. I did not realize that that was not the way to go about discontinuing these medications. And I had a severe, severe withdrawal syndrome um, that has persisted to date. I am a little over eight years off of medication and I'm still having pretty debilitating um, symptoms. I don't want to call them withdrawal symptoms because I don't think I'm technically in withdrawal anymore. I think I've been you know, my body has been damaged or insulted in some way by exposure to the medications. So that uh, is a little bit of my story. And I think we'll just kind of move now into some of the questions. So um, why did all of you decide to be public about your story? Like Christy and I work together at Benzo Information Coalition, which is a nonprofit about benzodiazepines. And we get emails all the time um, from other medical professionals like doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners, nurses, you name it. And they don't want to tell their story publicly. They don't want to talk about it. They're scared. And on one level that kind of annoys me because like the only reason they have someone to email who is a doctor or a PA is because we have come out and told our stories, right? So they have someone in us, but I also understand why they don't want to come forward as well. So why do you think you guys decided to speak out about this? Well, I know for me that I was just so blindsided by what happened to me. And I just saw that there was a huge gap in medical knowledge because I would have never taken a benzodiazepine if I'd known um, you know, how badly this could go. And I, I never received that in my training. So that just made me so angry that a person could made sickened by a drug and, you know, for years and years, possibly even permanently, and it's not even taught in medical school. So physicians are recognizing these adverse events. And so I ended up writing an open letter um, through BIC um, 
about my story and things just kind of took off for me from there. I did have freedom that, you know, some of the medical professions, professionals you talk about are still working and they just don't always have the freedom to speak out. I know that's like, I have a, a ophthalmologist friend that was tapering alongside me that I met on Benzo Buddies and she can't speak out because she's still in practice. Um, and so luckily I was a stay at home mom when all this happened to me. And um, so I've had the freedom to be able to speak out. Um, right, so I find that funny that an ophthalmologist is reluctant to speak out. I mean, I mean, I guess there's a few things going on. I mean, uh, you know, knowing about the harms of, of medication is, is part of increasing medical knowledge and, and, and being better able to serve patients. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very peculiar situation where talking about what has happened to you from a medication is, is met with um, ridicule or censure or, or um, belittlement or harassment. Um, so it's very, very peculiar. Um, I, I, I guess a little bit similarly to Christy, I, I was, I didn't have much to lose really when it first happened to me. I mean, I, I, I had, I had thought about not returning to work because I was so unwell. Um, so I guess it had, I wasn't really thinking about the future of my career. That wasn't, I wasn't sure that I was going to have a career. Um, I'm still not sure whether I'll have a career after, after this. Um, but I guess I guess it was a combination of things. One, um, I, I people around me are using these drugs. Uh, friends of mine, my my family. I mean, essentially, actually, every every member of my immediate family is on a psychiatric drug of some sort because it's a very medical family, it's a neurotic family. So I think we have all the risk factors for. Um, walking into doctor's offices to ask for help. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, so I, I, I very much want there to be, um, you know, information out there for people so that they can make informed choices. Um, I don't want people to fall into the same trap that I fell into, um, taking these medications long-term um, without adequate knowledge. Um, I, I I, I guess I was also outraged. Um, Peter doesn't know it, but I read I read a lot of Peter's blog, and I, and I saw the response that Peter received to, to coming about about his experience. And I just find it so um, outrageous that people um, are more keen to defend, you know, their status and their um, their profession's good name than look after the well being of people. In some cases, the very lives of people. You know, I think. As I read about, you know, if it, if it had just been me, if I thought, oh, look, I've just had a very bad reaction, I've got a very weird physiology, you know, very bad luck to me, I've spent years, I think I would have gone away, you know, and just continued with my life. But I think the fact that I saw thousands of people online with the exact same story made me realise it's, it's, not, it's not just me. Um, I'm not sure if it's everybody, but it's certainly, mm -hmm. it's certainly not, not, a, not an isolated case. Um, I, and I guess I just found it outrageous that people were not um, paying attention to it, were not giving it the, um, the attention that it deserved. Um, and I guess all those things motivated me to, to, to talk about it. Hello. Hi, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks everybody. Um, I'm not sure I can add much more. I. Uh, I, I've been in the fortunate position that I'm married to a GP, uh, a Shan, my wonderful wife, and we've both been doctors for a long time. And it's given, we've had, I've had the advantage of being both a specialist and the generalist and living, uh, being married to a generalist that I would like to be. Um, I've always been a naturally open person. Um, those people who read my writings without knowing me might think that I'm anti-medication or um, have some sort of intrinsic um, need to 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 be uh, to to uh, to be somehow against um, medical treatments. I'm not. 
I think any interventions can have the potential for benefits and harms and a whole range of experiences in between. Speaking up about my own experiences, why did I do this? Well, I guess um, because what happened to me, and I don't think, I, I never thought that, I never, I never believed that what my, my experiences may extrapolate to everybody else. I, I like to believe in the scientific principle, but what happened to me could, was so, so hellish and I'm still living with it, the, 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 the Siroxat, is that I felt I needed to speak up about it. And um, I, I've trained as, not just as in medicine, but I, I also have a degree in arts um, in landscape architecture. And that, um, and I've got many interests. Doesn't make me a better person, but I've got many interests. And so I, um, long ago, after I'd faced my hellish, I tried to come off um, Siroxat probably somewhere between five and 10 times. But the last time I tried to come off it, I, I learned by this stage that I needed to go as slow as possible. And this was long before, long, long before even uh, the internet was just beginning. Um, I did so um, using li a liquid preparation of Siroxat and a micro pipette, and I tried to reduce over 18 months. And I felt, I, uh, you know, I, I managed it, but I felt like shit physically and mentally. And remember, I started this drug for anxiety. And uh, a few months after that, this I'm going back 15 years now, um, I felt so hellish. I could felt my mood plummeting. I'd never felt like this way before. Um, and eventually I ended up in hospital. Um, and I, I won't go through the whole story, but it, it was hell. But um, and my, my children were we then. <laughs> um, and I ended up with all sorts of treatments, including ECT and um, multiple psychiatric medications um, and um, huge consequences for myself, my wife, my ch young children. Um, I hate recalling it in the media, but I felt I had to do that because my colleagues didn't didn't consider that this, they felt this was um, what my experience was a result of psychiatric illness. Of course it could have been, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't. I'm absolutely certain. Um, and it, that, that doesn't diminish the potential benefits of psychiatric medications for some people. And um, I do not want to in any way diminish people who have benefited from medications. I'm just saying that my experience and what we've seen from Facebook and the internet increasingly is that many people who have longer term experience of medications realize that these medications ha can have potentially lasting effects. And I felt I had to speak up about this because um, sometimes, I, sometimes it, 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 it makes me almost want to cry that my colleagues, my immediate colleagues didn't want to believe me. Um, because I make short films, um, over 15 years ago, I made a short film called Powerful Embrace because Siroxat was, um, was uh, promoted as um, having a powerful embrace. The, the, that was, the promotion was a positive one, but in terms of uh, looking back on it now, the powerful embrace has been um, hell. These, these days, though I look, I, I like to think I look okay, um, I, I, I have a urinary, urinary incontinence, um, I sleep, I, I, I sleep almost not at all. Well, no, when I say sleep not at all, my sleep is, uh, I have rapid wakening. Um, um, there's all sorts of things I live with, but I'm a scared shitless of trying to come off this drug again because, because of what I went through 15 years ago. Uh, it's a drug I hate, it's a drug I don't want. Uh, many people in the in the medical uh, in the Facebook community understand this, um, but uh, and I'm not saying this. I, we, we understand from from emerging studies that those people who have problems with psychiatric drugs like antidepressants, in terms of uh, dependence and withdrawal symptoms, um, there there may be as many as half 
50% people to, who don't have those problems. And I certainly saw that in practice. Many people could stop psychiatric drugs. But my strongest advice to most people would be be very careful in terms of uh, stopping psychiatric drugs. Take, take medical advice, though the medical support that you may seek in doing so in stopping as slowly and carefully as you can do will be very, very, very limited. Okay. So I can't, I can't really add much. My, you know, answer would probably be similar to all of you. I, I think the only thing I would add is that I feel like this, these medications almost killed me and that's not an over-exaggeration. I almost lost my life to this. And, um, I just felt like, well, the only reason I figured it out is because somebody else was brave enough to tell their story publicly. And I was lucky enough to come across it and figure this out for myself. And I, I feel like if I wouldn't have found that story, I might not be alive. And so I sort of felt like the only right thing to do was to turn around and, you know, put my story out there too, in hopes that maybe, you know, someone who was me then will find my story too. And it could, um, you know, be someone's light bulb moment that their medications were making them sick. So, um, let's see. So you guys have talked a little bit about putting your stories out there and some of the, you know, disappointment that you faced from your colleagues, um, not believing, uh, that the medications had harmed you. And so, Mark and I have talked a little bit about um, in the United States, we have the Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm. And Mark, you told me there's not the exact same thing in like UK or Australia, but that the idea of not doing harm is like at the core of medical ethics across the globe. So if we believe that doctors and medical providers, which I do think, you know, almost probably across the board want to help their patients mm. and not harm and we truly believe in this first doing no harm why do you think nobody wants to hear about the harm go peter go hello yeah can you hear me yeah i think i um I, 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 I totally agree, Nicole. I think um, I, I spent 25 years in medicine. My wife is still working as a GP. I think absolutely my overwhelming experience is the, the vast majority of people in the healthcare profession want to help other people. They're compassionate, kind. I think, however, there is a bit of group behavior going on. And I think that that probably is is a significant reason why, and, and that explains why there's fear. There is great fear of departing from the crowd. And uh, particularly when we talk about in this terms, which in, in the time we live in, in terms of evidence-based medicine, which I am so, totally subscribed to, but we must remember that evidence-based medicine cannot, is, is contained within itself. There needs to be some philosophy here because evidence-based medicine looks at sp specifics and it's often time contained contained, and often has other constraints in it. And one of uh, some of those constraints beyond the short time period, which of most studies is, is that there is, and the, I have no answer for this, but there is vested interest. And we live in, whether we like it or not, not just in medicine, I see great advances in medicine. I do not deny those in any way. But um, there are vested interests. And I've campaigned in Scotland for 10 years for Sunshine legisl legislation, which would, uh, which means that we need to understand, which basically is asking for what, what science should be. Science should be transparent. The data about us all should be there. It shouldn't be hidden. It shouldn't be... Um, and it, and when and it, if it, if it, uh, hopefully if it's all transparent, it should be written. It should be allow everybody to look at it. Um, and my concern, particularly in all professions in psychiatry, and some of my, my psychiatrist colleagues.
um, do not like me, I think it's fair to say, because um, I, I have done my best to share what is in the public domain and make it as obvious as possible, given my artistic tendencies. So in terms of competing interests, I don't believe that anybody who is paid by the pharmaceutical industry, industry is inherently bad. But I think the net effect is that it brings bias. So um, the, the BMG editor talked about um, paid opinion leaders being a blot on the scientific landscape. I agree with that. I think I, that, that doesn't mean any of them are bad. They're not bad people, they're good people. But we need to understand that our need for quick fixes may mean that the science can market that. And I think, uh, and I think, my worry, my main worry is that psychiatric. I, 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 I'm going to speak very simply, and I'll, I'll shut up quickly. Uh, but my main worry is that uh, psychiatric drugs have been marketed as disease specific, and I think most psychiatric drugs include our um the, there's no clear um dividing line between drugs that are treat, street drugs and psychiatric drugs and that's increasingly becoming the case as psychostimulants um psychedelics um ketamine and other drugs are being marketed it doesn't mean that these drugs don't have effect and can ease ease suffering but we need to be careful in considering that they um that they are specific for um, specific uh, what what are what are now called mental dis men, uh, 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 a league of classification of mental disorders, and I think my main concern and um, all the guidelines across the world, none of them consider the long, none of them clearly consider the evidence because there is no evidence for the long term effects of these drugs. And in Scotland, we know that people who are taking, there is a, the, 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 the data shows that people who are taking um, drugs for serious mental illness seem to die 10 to 15 years younger than the, those who do not. Now that doesn't mean it's all due to the drugs. Um, I'm not convinced by the arguments that people say that that's just due to the illness or the lifestyle of those people living with it. Um, so when I was a uh, uh, last thought, when when I was working as a psychiatrist and I worked for older adults, those people over sixty five, I very rarely saw, and this is anecdote, I accept that I very rarely saw people um, who had been treated in the long term with um, uh, moving on from antidepressants with antipsychotics. I very rarely saw them saw people coming into my uh, clinic who were over the age of 75. I can, I can think of, I, I can hardly think of a single person who was over 80, who was on an antipsychotic who came to my clinic. Now that I, I appreciate that's an anecdote, but I think the evidence has begun to show that long-term exposure to psychiatric drugs, as we might understand, as is the case with, with all drugs, um, is not without consequences. And I'll stop there. I'll, I'll take up a few of those points. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interlocking reasons for, for people not wanting to hear this, and, it's a, and, and there's a, and there's different it, it, there's different effects at different levels. So I think your average psychiatrist, my colleagues, I agree with Peter. You know, I've gone to lectures with them. I, I've gone, you know, I've gone to picnic with them. They're all very lovely people. They want to, uh, you know, do their professions go home and look after their children and, and, and to help patients. That's very much what they want to do. Um, they have also been taught in a certain system. They've been taught certain things. Um, you know, that you know, I was taught by the same system and the system tells you these drugs are very helpful, um, you know, with few side effects or in some cases, slightly more severe side effects that you can manage. And that's what you're walking around with. That's the, that's the model that you have. And you're told that by you know, professors and seniors that you you respect. And of course, in medical school, you know, it's full of people who are very used to deferring to people that know a lot more than them. So it's a sort of a, that's part of the system. When someone pops up, some patient 
and says something completely opposite to what you've heard for years. This drug is hurting me, this drug is making me sicker. It, it, it almost doesn't register. I remember actually now patients saying that to me and I just thought, you know, I often thought they're, they're crazy essentially because I had this, in, you know, in, in, incredible set of knowledge. I'd seen all these graphs on, on lectures. I'd heard people say these things. So some patient saying it, you know, I, I would listen to them and, but I would kind of be, you know, they didn't have the same credibility that my professors had. So I would sort of dismiss them. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, that's the same, that's the same power dynamic that's, that's, that's um, occurring amongst a lot of psychiatrists. Second to that, there's an emotional response. You, you know, I, like a lot of doctors, I spend a lot of my time studying very hard, working very hard. I don't want to hear that actually what I've been doing is harming people. You know, that's mm. extremely, that's the opposite of what I want to hear. I want people to come up to me and say, you know, Mark, gee, you're such a great guy. You've been so helpful to so many people. Thank you. I don't want them to be saying, you know, actually you're causing huge trouble. Mm. So I think the first response to that is, you know, is, is defense to push it away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I think those are the things that are, that are going on in the kind of general, um, uh, uh, psychiatrist. I think the, the layer above that, the people giving those lectures, the professors and the, the thought leaders that, that Peter's referred to, I think they have a different level of culpability because I think they understand things much more closely. Mm -hmm. I think, I think as Peter says, um, for them, there's a lot of, there's a lot of power, status and money in what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they are aware much more of the problem with these drugs and have an interest in, in minimizing the problems and in exaggerating the benefits. They often use a word evidence-based. Um, I actually think that's shortening for, in, in, when it comes to psychiatric drugs, for poorly evidence-based or not much of an evidence base. Because just because there's studies doesn't mean it's a good evidence base. So taking an example like antidepressants, by criteria that are broader than just psychiatry, studies that go for six weeks that show you know, clinically insignificant differences, that, that is what constitutes a poor evidence base. So when people walk around saying, well, these treatments are evidence-based, that they're, they're, um, they're skewing things, you know, they're, they're putting forward a certain sort of narrative. Um, so, sorry, I just won't go on too long, but if you compare it to other, other fields of medicine, for example, statin drugs given for cholesterol, statins were accepted as a treatment um, after a 5.4 year placebo controlled trial amongst four and a half thousand people in Scandinavia. So statins are very widely used, but the evidence for them is based on very long-term trials. So it, it, is, um, it is absurd that antidepressants and other psychiatric drugs are as widespread as they are based on six week trials. Now the reason why six week trials exist is because that's what regulators in different countries ask for, that's, what, that's the minimum requirement for companies to produce that sort of data to get licensing, which is not the same as producing useful evidence in clinical practice. So, so I think the truth of it is, sorry, uh, it, it is that the, the, the evidence for psychiatric drugs is extremely poor. Um, and anybody who is walking around saying, um, you know, these are very evidence-based treatments is either has been brainwashed by their training or is being paid to say that. And you know, I'm being quite blunt here, but that's that's the truth of the matter, I think. And so I'll just add, I think there's also this underlying bias that if something is prescribed for therapeutic use, then it's safe and there's not gonna be any adverse events, but um, I definitely found that to be untrue in my own case. Um, it's, I think there's just a lack of education on the clinician's part about recognizing adverse events. Oftentimes, you know, the setting of benzodiazepines, you get increasing anxiety sometimes with long-term use, and they interpret that as a, um, you know, worsening of the patient's underlying condition. Maybe they came in initially for anxiety and now it's worse and they add more medications instead of recognizing that it's due to the benzodiazepine. And I'll say there's a definite lack of training on recognizing adverse events. That's not something what, that was really ever addressed during my internal medicine training. And we have, for instance, we have the FDA MedWatch program where you're supposed to, um, in the US, report any adverse events. And um, I never learned about that in my training. I only learned about that um, after 
starting work with benzodiazepine advocacy and awareness. So, you know, I, I think that's a huge reason also that clinicians just aren't recognizing these events. Yeah, I think I read somewhere, Christy, that only 1% of adverse events are reported to the, the FDA MedWatch program, or I think it's called the yellow card scheme or something like that. And the Canada gets the yellow card. Maybe. Yeah, they, there's a different name for every country, but there is a place to report those events um, for sure. But they're very rarely reported and anyone can report them. It can be the person harmed. It can be their doctor. It can be a family member. Um, so definitely. Um, I wanted to talk about um, with Christy and Mark just a little bit about how um, in the United States, the benzodiazepines have just gotten a black box warning, which is the FDA's like highest warning on a product, which in my opinion is decades late. But as um, Mark and Christy and I were sort of collaborating on a project recently, a piece of writing, it occurred to me that, and Mark pointed out, there are guidelines in the UK that are much different for benzodiazepines than are in the United States. It's like, but here we are, we're just a body of water apart, but the chemical structure of this medication is the same, right? I don't think you guys have a different Xanax formulation where you are. So why is like raising the fact you think that, well, look over here in the UK, they're saying and recognizing this is actually a very dangerous compound that needs to be treated and respected as such and handled as such. But here in the United States, even with this black box warning, we have physicians writing letters saying, oh, no, no, disregard that advice from the FDA. The patients need their benzodiazepines. There's going to be people who are harmed because they can't get their benzodiazepines long term. How do you, what do you think about the fact that other countries were just you know, barely separated by distance and some recognize it and some don't. And how do we like make sense of that? I mean, sorry, the, the UK, the difference between the UK and America, it's not, it's, as you say, not the chemical structure, it's the political structure. Um, you know, in, in, in the UK, we have a national health service watchdog nice which is imperfect but at least it analyzes data with an interest to costs and safety and effectiveness um in a way that you don't have in america i mean from my perspective in america it looks like things are generally run by corporations um you know the the, the divide between benzodiazepines is immense i mean essentially all our guidelines say do not give benzodiazepines for anything if you give it, give it for a couple of weeks. Um, as I said, most people are given it, you know, from, from family doctors in one tablet or three tablet packets for flying um, or some other short-term um, measure um, because it's understood that it's highly addictive, it's highly ineffective um, and it causes more trouble. Um, in America, it looks like you, you lack any kind of mechanism to protect people from the interests of companies. I mean, um, the FDA is 80% funded by drug companies, you know, under the Padufa Act, so that the FDA has been described not as the regulator of companies, but as the servant of them because its major funders are companies. In Britain, in some ways it's worse because 100% of all of the funding for our equivalent, the MHRA is from drug companies. But we have an extra layer of safety for patients, which is nice. Um, so it, it, it makes me afraid of America. When I hear the stories of what of the sort of polypharmacy, the long-term medication, it's, 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 I find it scary. Yes, it is very scary. And I feel like we're definitely behind the times here. Y'all are much more advanced as far as um, having, it, I guess, central recommendations for benzodiazepine prescribing and even deprescribing. Um, and I don't know if that was because of the work of Heather Ashton. She was there. Um, 
because it seems like here in the US, we don't always pay attention to things happening in other countries. We're just more interested in our own literature. We, we have a handful of prescribing guidelines here, but none of the major medical societies that I've seen have any kind of central uh, prescribing recommendations. So that's something that we need to work on and hopefully we'll take care of in the future. So this one might be, I don't know, a little controversial. Um, I was reading something from a psychiatrist. I, I guess he would be considered a mainstream psychiatrist just talking about um, those of us um, who have been harmed by the medication. And he's basically saying that there's a potential for dialogue between the psychiatrist and people like us who've taken the medications and who've had bad experiences. But he says the use of polemical language like prescribed harm, brain damage and torture can provoke defensiveness on the part of clinicians and render common ground elusive. So what do you think about um, taking offense to the terms that those of us who, and not just, you know, us for medical professionals, but just anybody who took medications like this. Um, do you think we need to tone our language down or do you think it's offensive that our language is even being policed when the most offensive thing is that people are being harmed? I mean, I know I've used the word torture to describe what I went through because it was fucking torture. I mean, I, I don't know what else to, to say, you know, but um, prescribed harm. I mean, I'm not really sure what's so offensive about that. It was a prescribed medication and I feel like it harmed me. So what do you guys think about this, you know, um, communicating between the two sides and, and this language barrier? I mean, I think in an ideal world, we'd be able to just tell it like it is and tell the truth and use words like torture because that's really the way it is and was. But unfortunately, we're trying to advocate. And I always feel like in my awareness effort, efforts, I'm trying to continually communicate with professionals and not offend them. And I, I don't really have a good answer for this, but I, sometimes I do tone down my language um, just to try to, to bridge that gap. I mean, Mark has said he's, you know, acting as a translator, you know, between the, uh, the online community and the academic community. And I think that sometimes we just have to um, tone it down a bit to bridge the gap. Hi. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I'm, my wife is, uh, has a lasting ability with language, um, was ducks of her school and has taught me a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested in use of language and I've written a lot about that in my, my blogs. Uh, there's something I want to say and I want to say it loud. Um, I, I, I really am concerned about what's happening on social media, uh, social media um, in term, not just not just in relation to psychiatry, but in, in relation to a lot of things, because it encourages divides. Um, I I'm passionately believe in the freedom to speak up. However, I equally passionately believe that we need to be respectful and constructive in what we do online. And some of what I've seen, now I'm not on social media, but I have from the distance of Google, being able to observe, and I no longer do because it's, it just distresses me too much. Some of what I've seen from not just UK professionals in mental health, but worldwide professionals in mental health, the def I think it's based on defensiveness. Absolutely, I understand that. But some of the language and continuing denigration of experience that they don't want to hear I want to hear all experience. I think all experience matters, whether it's whether any any medical intervention brings about positive effects or harmful effects or effects in between. I think we should hear about that. That's the very basis. It's a prerequisite for science. But some of the behavior 
and I'm going, I'm speaking quite strongly here. I can speak from a position because I'm retired, but it's absolutely abhorrent. And it's not just psychiatrists, it's other mental health professionals. They need to reflect on some of their behavior because if they close down listening, I, I understand that social media in particular brings about passionate voices, but those people who have experienced harm should be heard. Sometimes their voices will be very raw. I, I, I understand their arguments, but they need to consider what they are doing on social media. Because if you close down listening to voices, if you become defensive about your profession, putting it ahead of people's experiences, and this doesn't diminish people who have positive experiences, psychiatric interventions. I spent my career as a psychiatrist. I'm not an anti-psychiatrist. I believe psychiatry is, needs to be there. Um, I don't like the term, the medical model. Um, and I, we could get into endless debates about what is biopsychosocial, but we need to listen to the experience of people who have experience beyond what Mark has rightly called the very short term evidence base and very far from an ideal evidence base. We don't need to be defensive about this. We need to listen to other, one another. We need to be kind. Even the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the former president, Wendy Byrne, said, why do we have all this nastiness? And she's right. We need to work together. We need to listen. We don't need to be defensive. We don't need to divide one another. The very basis of science is learning from one another. Um, and not trying to be always right, not trying to point score against one, one profession against another, uh, one person against another, one professional against a patient or a former patient. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that uh, I absolutely hate this, ter th this term that um, Professor, Sir Professor Simon Wesley promoted a hashtag called pill shaming because pills interventions are really important. Science is based on this. I don't want to diminish anybody that has benefited from medications, but to divide it in a hashtag and to use a bingo card as is used in social media, whether it's for positive or negative effects of any intervention, it, 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 just, it just divides us all. It doesn't advance science and we end up in endless debates rather than listening to one another, sharing experience of those who have benefited and those who have harmed, and most of all, those who are in between those two poles. So I'll we'll stop there. I won't add too much. I guess I'll, I've got a few responses. I mean, I think one, you know, the first response is, it's absurd that people who have been harmed need to consider the feelings, people who are offended by people talking about that. You know, that's, first off, that's, that's that's that is a very weird reality um you know and i think uh, as everyone said the defensiveness of these professionals i mean you know number one i think um they protest too much you know that level of defensiveness um you know it looks it looks close to hysterical to me um but number two i do like christy a little bit modify my language. I think I've been slightly unguarded this evening, um, but 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 in general, um, you know, I, I think you know, I often think about this as a little bit like a liberation movement because there are people um, on a weaker power basis, patients who are being harmed by the actions, whether intentional or not, and I think generally unintentional, of people on a higher you know power run. And that is that is the, the structure of a liberation movement. Um, and it's often the case that people in those, that the people who are protesting are, are, are labeled as angry or um, divisive. You know, I think about um, uh, racial equality, especially in America, or um, environmental protesters. It's always, it's, it's, there's a very, to me, it's, it's, um, it's the standard model, you know, they are the, the protesters are ridiculed, laughed at, dismissed, um, you know, until they win, um, because uh, you know people are protecting their their, their good names, their their their, um, 
their status, their profession, their income, all sorts of things. Um, you know, and, and less so in America, but more in the UK, there, there have been changes, there have been movements forward, there has been progress, there has been greater appreciation of the harms. And I think that will only, I think unfortunately, because so many people are harmed, there are so many thousands, hundreds of thousands, and probably millions, it would be very hard to hold back the floodgates. So to me, it's just a matter of time before these things are given the, um, the attention that they, that they merit. In the meantime, I try as much as passion allows and anger. And I guess that's a big, that's the big thing here. I, you know, there's a lot of anger here, which I think is understandable. I try to be polite because I, I understand the, the mindset of the people on, who are defending their turf, because I think mm. I, I often reflect if I hadn't been this, in this situation firsthand, I think that I may be, uh, I may admire some of the people that Peter named because yeah. I, I would have thought, you know, this is my, you know, this is what I know to be the case. And I'm very proud of the people that are standing up for what is correct against yeah. these, uh, you know, nutters or troublemakers or, or whatever. You know, and I would have thought, look, all these, these strange symptoms, you know, these, these do seem very peculiar. You know, how could, it, how could a relatively safe drug like a benzodiazepine or a, an antidepressant leave people bed bound for years and, and having an you know, That doesn't sound, doesn't sound plausible to me. That sounds, you know, nuts. And so if I had a choice between listening to my training, all these very well-qualified people around me versus a bunch of strangers on the internet, I think I would have probably chosen um, taking my allegiance with the people that I, I knew and whose qualifications I trusted. So I, I kind of understand if that's groupthink, that's a certain sort of mind. So I, I understand a lot of the skepticism and disbelief on that side, you know, whilst also being appalled by it. It's my rambling response. Yeah, good. Yeah, Mark, and I, I've admitted before in one of these conversations, I can't remember which, when I was early into benzodiazepine, well, polypharmacy withdrawal, really, and I showed up on Benzo Buddies, I thought to myself, well, when I saw reports of protracted harm, and maybe this is my karma for thinking this, that I got protracted harm, um, is that no way like how could this go on for eight nine years mm. and my thought was well these people were on psychiatric medications and so you know and here I am you know eight years off the medication and I'm still having difficulty so definitely to what you're saying you know it's you can make sense of that thought process um, yep. from where we sit for sure so we started a little bit late. Do you guys have time for maybe one or two more questions? Is sure. that okay? Okay. Um, so from um, being patients ourselves who took the medications and who experienced all these bizarre symptoms and things, um, I know looking back on my own situation, I mean, granted I was young when I started taking the medications and young people are typically more healthy, but I had almost, no medical records at all when I, prior to taking the medication, as soon as I was prescribed over that five year period, my medical records became a stack of medication. I mean, a stack of, you know, records for, I had GI scopes, upper and lower. I had seen a rheumatologist because I had rashes all over my body. I mean, I, it was like endless specialist appointments and nobody, said like, well, you're taking six drugs. Maybe there's some kind of toxicity happening or they could be at the cause of this. So how worried are you and how much do you think about like how many people are there out there that are patients that are going undiagnosed or misdiagnosed with all kinds of things and, and then also the cost to society and you know how much money I look back on how much money I spent seeking and going down all these rabbit holes um, and even just yesterday I went to the eye doctor and I've got severe dry eye which weirdly enough when I came off of psychiatric drugs I got horrible dry eye and horrible dry mouth so now do I have some real problem that's causing it or is this just still you know this is something that people who have 
problems coming off these medications and being on them, we grapple with all the time. Is it from the meds or do I, now I have a real new problem. So how much do you think about like, wow, how much is this affecting, you know, patients and it's just going unrecognized? Mark? I'll jump in. So one, sorry, I, I also have extremely thick medical records. So I relate to everything you're just saying. I've seen endless specialists. I just, I just thought of some things then that you've mentioned that I, I've seen gastroenterologists as well as neurologists and sleep doctors and all sorts of things. And in fact, I, I went in on one occasion to a sleep doctor and said, look, there's this paper that says antidepressants interrupts normal sleep. So do you think my sleep problems could be due to the antidepressant? He said, no, 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 you're on a low dose. It's very safe, you know, which, which I'm sure I've said to patients as well before, um, because that's, that's exactly what I thought. So I, I think this is a huge problem. And I think it comes back to what, what Peter was saying. Um, you know, all, I think it was William Osler who said, all medicines are poisons. The difference is in the dose. So, you know, there is very little difference between the medications that we use and illicit drugs, as, as Peter mm -hmm. said. Benzodiazepines, you know, are essentially have the same actions as alcohol. They're slightly less toxic to the liver. Um, antidepressants have the same molecular effects as MDMA or ecstasy, you know, in lower dose, slightly less potent. So if we saw somebody who was taking a low dose of ecstasy every day, we would expect a lot of medical problems as we do with people who are taking alcohol every day. But because we have a sanitized view of these medications as produced by reliable companies and, and, and packaged in impressive academic articles, we don't think of them in the same way as we do uh, illicit drug users. And I think if we did, we would see, you know, I've got to say since, you know, I've had the experience of, of thinking very conventionally for, for years and, and having my frame changed in the last three years, the number of times when I, because I still do shifts at the hospital, I still, I still I work as a psychiatrist. The number of issues I see that I can see are, are related to adverse effects of the drugs is immense. And I think I completely missed them before. I didn't, I, I was trained not to see them. I was trained to see uh, medical, you know, mental health conditions. Um, so I think it's a huge problem. I, I think about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome um, in, in, in people. I think about irritable bowel, you know, and, and I guess there's a, a whole lot of things you know, who know the, the, the real answer is what are these drugs doing to the body long term? The answer is we have no idea because we never looked. So could they affect skin, the immune system? Things they probably do. They all seem to have effects uh, on all those systems. So I think there's a huge amount of morbidity walking around due to these drugs, um, and as you say, huge costs to to people paying for drugs that are probably probably in the best case useless and in some cases harmful maybe for a very small group of people useful in the long term. Um, so I think it's a, it's a huge problem. And then uh, as, 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 as of course you, you, you understand, you know, people who, are, who have come off these drugs and then, and then get diagnosed with other conditions. And I've heard about things like chronic fatigue syndrome and medically unexplained syndrome and functional neurological disorder, um, anxiety and depression. And of course, most people don't find social media groups. So there are probably people walking around who had Peter's experience or my experience or your experience, who have been told that they're very mentally ill and are on many drugs. So it's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge issue. It's got implications for uh, public health spending, you know, and people's well-being. And, and probably there are, you know, there are probably deaths because of it. Um, I think we've all, we've all been pretty close. Yeah, so that's, that's me. And same for yeah. me, I have the thick medical chart. Um, I got pretty ill very quickly with Xanax and spent a whole month on the medical mystery tour and um, neurologists, rheumatologists, lots of tests, ex expensive tests, gastroenterologists, and you know, nothing came up and I'm lucky I figured out, you know, what was going on via the, the internet or maybe I'd still be sick. Um, but yeah, this has got to be a huge problem because as I mentioned before, the lack of training about recognizing adverse effects. And, um, you know, I just, it just makes me wonder back in my clinical practice, I was a cardiologist. I'm wondering how many patients I had that were on a benzodiazepine and I 
didn't think to myself, hey, maybe their tachycardia could be related to benzo tolerance and withdrawal. You know, that just never crossed my mind. Um, so I just, it just makes me wonder. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree, Christy. Um, I, I think this is a bit about lack of training. Um, but from my position now as a retired doctor, well, I, I can see what I want. Um, I think it's also the very idea that medical professionals are somehow able to not show stigma or, or, or exhibit stigma is wrong. And I include myself in this and probably all of us here. Um, it's what, what I, in terms of what we're talking about tonight, and I call this almost in terms of the side effects, the iatrogenic effects of any medications, I call this hydra stigma. Hydra being the monster, the Greek monster, that way if you chopped off one head, you would get few more. And why I call it hydra stigma is that um, if you, I'm talking particularly about here in, in terms of psychiatric diagnoses, if you, if you say in my case, I'll just for simplification, you go along with anxiety. I got the medication. They ended up um, many years later and uh, after withdrawing as slowly as I possibly could from a drug with a very severe depression, mental state, uh, akathisia, um, determined to end my life. I was then that, that Hydra because of the, I, I was, because I had initially been labeled with a mental health disorder, in this case, anxiety. Any thoughts that I expressed thereafter, any experiences I related thereafter from well-meaning people around me, lovely people around me, part my nurse's colleagues apart, um, were experiences less valid as less meaningful because they were felt to come from my mental disorder. I've never had to, I, 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 I'm an anxious person. I, I'm an intense person. I live life to the full, but I, I, I'm, um, I will never have manic depression. I, I am, so all these sorts of things that, so, but I, I guess the point, the hydra stigma is the fact that all of us in this panel here tonight, it's likely that those, uh, if I, I would suggest that those mental health, some of those mental health professionals, particularly the leading thought leaders, the narrative controllers, as I call them, will consider us as having, uh, our, as our arguments being less valid because we are somehow have a mental disorder, inverted commas. And I don't know how we deal with that other than just putting our, ourselves forward as honestly and openly as we can. And that's really hard. That's the double blind. It's so hard to speak about these effects in the public domain. It doesn't mean that everybody who's on a psychiatric drug ha will, have a, um, a rain, uh, will have all the consequences that maybe we have experienced. But why should we not be able to talk about these openly? Why should, we, why should our experiences be less believed? Is that not stigma? Is that not the stigma we are seeing from well-meaning, kind, honest people in the psychiatric profession? And why, is the lead, why are leaders in, the, mental, in the, the medical profession not addressing this iatrogenic stigma? Thanks, Peter. And just sort of like something that popped in my head to what you were just saying is, you know, the whole mental disorder diagnosis. I think it's important to bring up that a lot of these psychiatric medications, I mean, the net has been cast so wide. They're prescribed for things that aren't psychiatric conditions. Like Christy, I think you had dry eye, right? Was your original? Yeah. And I, it was so painful that I couldn't sleep. So I was, I was just using it at first to sleep. And of course I was a bit anxious obviously because I had some big medical crisis going on but but yeah it was really more not not really a psychiatric issue mm -hmm. but then when you start to come off and you have symptoms that are psychiatric in nature did you face some of the stigma like Dr. or Peter sorry is talking about oh yeah it was terrible because I when I began experiencing Xanax tolerance and interdose withdrawal my anxiety went 
through the roof. And I went back to the person that prescribed me the medication and she gave, tried to first, she tried to get me an SSRI. And then when that didn't work out, I came back to her and she just basically, and I told her that this was all the Xanax I needed to get off Xanax. And she just looked at me, you know, almost with this look of, you know, contempt, like you're so anxious, you'll never get off Xanax, you know, that this is all you, not the drug. And um, so uh, all of a sudden, and you know, all of my medical tests had come back normal. So all of a sudden I was just a head case in their eyes. And then, you know, since she wouldn't help me come off the Xanax, I found a psychiatrist and uh, came to her office and she basically treated me like I was suffering from addiction. She just said, give the pill bottle to your husband to control your use. That's why you can't get, get off Xanax. You just can't stop taking it. Um, so, so yeah. And then finally I found someone who believed me and helped me out, but, but yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of stigma going on there. Yeah. I had the same experience. I mean, I was lucky that in the end I was able to find a doctor who has been just amazing. And we've been together for the entire 10 years. We're on hugging terms now and she's a psychiatrist, you know? So, um, but I went through countless doctors trying to get what I was going through recognized and to not be treated just like you, like either a mental patient or a drug addict. It was one of the two. Yeah, never, either, either one. Yeah, never just was like accepted at face value. Like, yeah, you could take these medications. They could cause you harm. You could have physiological dependence and difficult time discontinuing them. Like that was like a foreign concept to most of the providers that I saw. And it Oh, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, sorry. The only good thing, Mark, when we were talking about like the variances in different countries in the United States, I guess you could relocate and your medical records don't follow you anywhere. So you could leave your, your fake mental diagnoses in a different state. But if you, if you live in the UK, your records go everywhere, right? Okay. One, uh, one good point. One good point. Okay. Yeah. One the US. So I think we'll have, uh, go ahead. Say, very briefly, I'll say it in one sentence. There's a new label in town, a new label in town. That label, and I, 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 don't, I don't mean to diminish anybody who's, who's, who has experiences, but the new label that may apply to people who have side effects of psychiatric drugs is functional, functional neurological disorder, FND. And its proponents... Um, it has a place. I'm not arguing against it, and it's important. But its proponents need to address and not avoid the issues of um, uh, the potential con contributions of prescribed drugs to functional neurological disorder. So I guess we'll maybe ask one more question, and then we can close. Although I could probably I could sit here and talk to you guys for the rest of the evening. Um, it just feels so good to, you know, have other people who sort of speak the same language and have had all the same experiences. Um, so what do you think after everything you've been through, um, being a patient and somebody who is a medical prov provider, what are your biggest takeaways or your lessons from this experience? Um, and, you know, if you want to share anything that you think about that, that would be useful for other people to know. Um, I feel like you should end on an optimistic note, but I, I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> I can, well, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try and I'll try and bring it around. I mean, um, you know, I've been taught about um, things that you know, affected the evidence base before this. You know, I'd read Ben Goldacre's book in, in the UK about the influence of the pharmaceutical companies on, on evidence. Um, and I understood that was an issue. I never understood how deep an issue it was um, until I experienced this firsthand. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm left with a great skepticism for the medical literature and, and, and inherited wisdom, especially from, you know, I, I, I will not trust, um, an eminent professor without seeing what they're talking about first. Um, I think that puts, you know, 
that, that puts people in a very difficult position. And I think this is a very dangerous, this is a very dangerous path for medicine to go along because um, if people start to lose faith in medicine because it, it is so corrupted, then people will be impacted because they'll miss out on useful medical treatments. Because of course there are many, medi there are many you know, useful and even life-saving medical treatments. So I think the integrity of the medical profession is um, on, on the line here. Um, you know, I sort of think, um, I can't, it's hard to think of an exact analogy, but you know, fossil fuel executives, you know, they lost, they lost you know, uh, the public respect because they have spent so many years denying the truth or, or, or tobacco company executives. You know, doctors are not in that category. They're, they're highly respected people. Um, but I think they risk losing that if they don't put their own house in order. And their own house needs to be, as Peter said, clear of drug company influence. It needs to be doing studies that are for the benefit of patients. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, there's this idea that you can write down your conflict of interest at the end of an academic paper and that's it. You know, you've, you've declared it. It's, it's sort of ridiculous. You know, you wouldn't get advice on cigarettes from people employed by tobacco companies. You wouldn't take advice on climate change from people that work for fossil fuel companies. It is absolutely absurd that people who get paid often more than their university salaries by drug companies could be seen as in any way an objective or, or trustworthy um, voice in, in, in academia and research. I think it's, I think, either one day we'll look back on this and laugh at how absurd it was, or we'll be in real trouble because if, if, if drug companies control medicine, we're gonna be very medicated and very unwell. Um, on, the, on the positive side, um, you know, I, I, I guess I've learned to listen to patients in a way that I, I may have had reservations about in the past. I mean, there's a bit of a, it's a bit difficult because you're taught to be skeptical of what patients say to you, not just in psychiatry. You know, if someone comes in and says, I'm having a heart attack, you don't say, oh, well, you're having a heart attack. You know, you, you, you do tests and you, and you, because people can misinterpret things. So you're sort of, so being skeptical, which can lead to being slightly cynical, is an element of being a doctor. Um, I think I, I can't get rid of that completely. I can't believe everything everybody says to me, but I think I will have. You know, I, I do have a far more open mind to hear what patients say. You know, and I, I hope that doctors around me um, will develop that because there's a real danger if you don't. You know, if you, if you put all your eggs in the basket of listening to uh, authority figures, you can, you can make some, some, some serious errors. Uh, so those are my takeaways. Yeah. And I can just echo what Mark said. I mean, we are very jaded and cynical in the medical profession and we don't I mean we we just look at everything very skeptically sometimes and I've got to say as being in the position of the patient and I wasn't believed it was absolutely terrifying so now I mean I don't want to say I didn't believe my patients before I, I did but it's just I would say to any providers out there just please listen to what your patients are saying and if they're saying they're having some adverse effect from from a medication that they're taking, that's you know very likely possible and something that needs to be investigated. Uh, you know, and another thing, um, I don't always just you know when I'm facing some sort of medical treatment, I research the heck out of it. Now I don't just rely on what I thought I knew from my medical training because of, sometimes it didn't always brush the surface. And so, um, you know, I'll talk to other patients who've gone through the the same thing and get information from them as well. You know, not just always relying on my doctor's expertise, but always just obtaining all the information possible that I can before I, you know, decide how to handle my health. Um, and I'd say this whole thing has given me um, an interest in advocacy and raising awareness about the issue. I'm very passionate about um, physician education because I just really don't want what happened to me to happen to other patients. Yep, I, uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I want to be positive, but I think science needs to embrace, this is quite obvious, but it needs to embrace ethics. We've lost this in recent times. We talk about improvement science and all sorts of things, but we need to embrace ethics. Because I'm interested in ethics, there's certain very senior 
uh, people in the Royal College of Psychiatrists that mock me because of my interest in ethics. They, they seem to think that, that I think I'm more ethical than other people. I don't think that at all. Of course I don't. Um, but I think that ethics matters to science. And I, I think um, what, what I mean by ethics is we need to think evidence matters. Of course, evidence matters, but evidence is more than just it's it, we are informed by evidence rather than based in evidence. And evidence, there will never be sufficient evidence because the world is end, endlessly complex and we pass through time and uh, um, evidence is con constrained by time and measurement. It's really important, but it's not sufficient. So my, so my plea is, <clears throat> is to people is to, is there a uh, last thing, um, there, there was a, there's, there's somebody that I really admire who's long dead and he's, he's called Patrick Geddes. He was a geographer and gardener. He was a professor in Edinburgh and his motto was, it's a Latin, I'm not good at Latin, but it's vivendo decimus. It's by living we learn, it's vivendo decimus. And we, vivendo decimus lives alongside evidence informed medicine. And if scientists and the medical profession, the caring profession forget this, I worry. So I could probably just, you know, echo most of what you guys said, but I think um, definitely just from the patient perspective of things, I would never just hand my health over like I did previously, um, just because somebody is, you know, a so-called expert at something, like Christy said, doing all my own research, but also the importance of a really good collaborative relationship with a medical provider. I don't think I really understood that before when I was in the patient role. I just, you know, I mean, obviously if somebody was really horrible to me, I probably would have found somebody else. But now at the first sign of just like not being listened to or not feeling like something is right, like I just find somebody better. You know, there's so many choices out there. And I realize now my power as a patient is to, I can fire somebody and I can go and I can find somebody that will listen and that will read the, the pamphlet that I bring to them. Um, and two, from the perspective of if I ever go back and practice again, like exactly what you, you guys said, just being a better listener and a better investigator and this whole notion that like, you know, I'm sure as patients, we've all heard it stay off the internet. Yeah. There's some stuff on the internet. That's not, <laughs> you know, you shouldn't listen to, but there's some really good stuff on the internet too, that you can educate yourself with and that you can learn from. And you know, there's, I, I don't think I would have survived this if I didn't find the online communities and I didn't find support from all the other patients that um, were going through this and who helped me through this when there was no medical professional, you know, to be found. So prior to all this, I would have been somebody who didn't even know that there were support groups on the internet because I didn't do that kind of thing. And now I have friends in all kinds of different countries and states that I've never met before, but I consider them my, you know, my internet friends because some of them saved my life, you know? So um, I think we'll close with that. And I'll just um, uh, say thank you everybody on the panel and in the audience for joining us for this live discussion. If you haven't seen the film Medicating Normal yet, please go to our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch. There you'll find a list of upcoming community screenings. And you can also look under the events tab on our Facebook page. We add more screenings all the time. So check back often. Um, we currently release new videos on our YouTube channel every Wednesday and Friday at noon central US time. And of course, we're gonna be having more live interviews here on Facebook every other week or so. Um, so tune into those. If you'd like to support our outreach efforts to bring the film and more conversations like this one to communities worldwide, you can make a donation at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. So once again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Christy Huff, Mark Horowitz, and Peter Gordon for spending the last hour and some change. And um, Honestly, I'm so honored to stand next to all three of you, and I hope you guys will keep doing the important work that you're doing.
So thank you so much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>